I've been running a few clusters in my home lab over the past few years, but they've always been virtualized inside of Proxmox. That all changed today when I decided to run my Kubernetes cluster on these three low power, small, and efficient Intel NUCs. These Intel NUCs are probably my favorite small form factor devices. They're only 4x4 four four inches and pack quite a punch. That's because these NUCs have anywhere from a Core i3 to a Core i5 to a Core i7 processor inside of them. This one has a Core i7 with 4 cores and 8 threads and has a base clock speed of 2.8 GHz and can turbo boost up to 4.7 GHz. It even has quick sync on the chip too so I can offload some encoding if I need to. For these three machines in my cluster, I maxed out the RAM on each machine, giving each 64 gigs of DDR4. This should be enough to run my workloads, and another reason I chose not to run a hypervisor on these machines. I wanted to conserve resources. So I added a terabyte Samsung NVMe drive for the OS and to run all my workloads, and then a second SSD for additional Kubernetes storage that will be replicated across all three of these devices. Now, I may expand this in the future, however, this was one of many SSDs I had laying around. Once I had all of the hardware buttoned up, then I had to decide where exactly I was going to put these devices. Now, I could have just put these on my workbench or on my desk, but I have a server rack in my basement that I wanted to take advantage of. Now, in my server rack, I have a few general purpose shelves, but I thought that these NUCs deserved a little bit better home than that. I wanted a rack mount system that would hold three NUCs, hold them securely in place, and even give me some cable management, and that's when I found this small company that makes all kinds of small form factor rack mount systems. MK1 Manufacturing makes all kinds of rack mount kits for small form factor devices like Mac Studios, Lenovo ThinkStations, Mac Minis, and of course, Intel NUCs. So I ended up purchasing one for my Intel NUCs and quickly rack mounted all three. It was super easy to rack mount these and mount these inside of this kit, and they even thought through the cable management for both power and networking. I bet you're wondering how I'm going to remote control these devices because, well, I was wondering that too. Well, if you remember from a previous video, I picked up a Pi KVM and was able to attach multiple devices to it using an HDMI switch. This current switch lets me connect up to four devices, but I'm going to try to expand it to eight later on. So a cool thing about using the Pi KVM, I can even power on these devices using Wake on LAN. That will send a magic packet to wake them up. And in the case that Wake on LAN doesn't work, I can then use my Unify Smart PDU to toggle the power on and off and force them to wake up. Gently force them to wake up. <laughs> After getting all of this hooked up on my network, I then had to figure out how I was going to get an operating system on them. I ended up using Maz or Metal as a Service to boot and provision these machines. I chose to go with Ubuntu Server for these, well, because I like Ubuntu and so is the rest of my infrastructure, so it makes it really easy to manage it the same way. I was sure to reserve static IP addresses for these devices, as well as create a DNS entry for them. Now, for the most difficult part of all, installing Kubernetes. <laughs> I bet you're asking, why Kubernetes? Well. This will be the shortest chapter in this whole entire video because, yeah, because, because I want Kubernetes. <laughs> so to install Kubernetes, I can do it one of a million different ways. And on top of that, I have many distributions to choose from. I ended up going with K3S because I like how lightweight it is and I like the active community behind it too. And as far as the installation goes, I could have spent 20 plus hours doing it manually but I've already created an Ansible playbook that can do all of this for me. It does everything for me in order to give me a high availability Kubernetes cluster with both HA Kubernetes API as well as HA service load balancers. With three nodes, I can lose up to one node and everything will still function normally, which is nice because <laughs> that's how many nodes I have. And while you're at it, if you're building a Kubernetes cluster, you should probably be sure that you are following Kubernetes best practices by using a tool from today's sponsor, Detree. How many times have you applied a Kubernetes configuration only to realize later that it was misconfigured, not configured according to best practices, or just plain wrong? These types of misconfigurations can create engineering churn and possibly even downtime. That's where Detree can help. Detree is an open source tool that prevents Kubernetes misconfigurations from ever reaching your production Kubernetes cluster. It does this by scanning Kubernetes objects against a centrally managed policy. 
This policy comes with Kubernetes best practices built in, but is flexible enough so that teams can customize the policy according to their organization's needs. And a tree isn't just a simple YAML enter, no, no, no. <laughs> Along with YAML validation, it also does schema validation as well as checking against your configured policy. The tree also comes with a fancy dashboard that is backed by great documentation to help you fix errors fast. The tree installs in seconds and can be run from a CLI, from Kube Control, in your CI and CD pipeline, and even as a Kubernetes admission hook that can intercept and test Kubernetes manifests, even in this last mile. The bottom line is that Detree can help prevent Kubernetes misconfigurations from happening in the first place. So see the link in the description to download Detree and help empower your engineers today. So to configure the playbook, I just needed to configure a few variables like my time zone, my interface names, and a few other options. I ended up deciding that since I only have three nodes, I will run etcd and the control plane on the same nodes that are running my workloads. Now, this is generally not recommended. You kind of want to separate these roles out, but I have enough compute, enough RAM, and it's running on NVMe drive, so it really shouldn't impact my small cluster. After setting my IP addresses, it was off to the races. I sat back and watched the automation for about three minutes. And shortly after that, I had a highly available Kubernetes cluster to run all of my workloads. If you'd like to do the same thing, I'll leave a link in the description that points to the documentation and the video where I walk you through all of this, a little bit slower. So once I had Kubernetes installed, I then copied my kubeconfig file locally so I can communicate with the cluster. I was able to ping the Kubernetes API, which is really a VIP, and it responded. I then asked Kubernetes to show me all of my nodes and there they were, all three of them. So what was there to do next? Well, next, I wanted to install some workloads and test out HA. Now, I typically would install traffic as my reverse proxy and then cert manager to manage my certificates and Loki and Grafana and Prometheus for logging, monitoring and visualization. <laughs> However, I just wanted to test a few things out before I go all in. So I decided to install a simple web server that runs Nginx. This website is just a tiny Nginx web server that hosts a single page that shows the host name, IP address, and port, and a few other things. My plan was to create this workload with three replicas and then pull the plug <laughs> on one of the nodes to make sure that both Kubernetes was still up as well as the web page. So that's what I did. I created a Kubernetes deployment for this container and set the replicas to three. This configuration will be sure that three are running but I wanted to be sure that they were spread out across all three nodes. Now, I did this by setting a topology constraint of the host name. This will make sure that more than one pod is never scheduled on the same node, so that can ensure HA. So once that was set, I deployed the Kubernetes deployment and I could see three pods across three different nodes. <laughs> this is awesome. But how do I actually get to the web page? Well, remember how I mentioned I typically use traffic for my reverse proxy? Well, that's where this would come in handy right now. It would allow me to expose multiple services on the same IP, but since I don't have it installed, I will just expose it on the Metal LB load balancer that comes with my playbook. To open up an IP to the virtual load balancer, all I have to do is create a service of type load balancer. This will expose the service on one of the Metal LB IP addresses so that we can see our web page. After deploying that service, we can then check the service to see which IP address it was signed to. And once we have that IP address, then we can get to the web page. And now we can see our web page here, so we know it's working. And it should be HA because we have one of these pods running on each one of the servers or nodes. So now we just need to introduce some chaos. No, 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 not that kind of chaos. Just simply removing one of the nodes is fine with me. So before doing that, let's ping our Kubernetes API to be sure that it stays up. And you can see here, it's responding. Next, let's open the web page and keep refreshing it. Now we can introduce the chaos by shutting down one of the nodes. We can pick any node that we like, but let's go with node two. Let's also ping node two so that you can see that it's actually going down. So we shut down node two and wait. We can see that it's down, but the Kubernetes API is still up. When we do a kube control get nodes, we can still see all of our nodes. And if we refresh this web page, we can see our website never went down. Now, if we shut down one more node now, we will lose access to our Kubernetes API and the web page. So let's shut down node one. 
And as you can see, we can't get to it anymore. But if we bring up node 2 and leave node 1 down, we can. Awesome, so now we have an HA cluster, but what can we do with it? Well, I mentioned a few things, but you can do some awesome home Kubernetes stuff like install Home Assistant, install some game servers, websites, or many other workloads. Just remember that not all workloads can be HA out of the box. They have to be stateless, like this Nginx container, meaning that they have no state like storage bounds or state and memory, but they get their state from outside of the container, like an external database. Now, I bet you're wondering how much power these devices use. Well, I wondered the same thing, and I checked my Unify PDU to be sure. I let all three NUCs run a few workloads and kept them on for a few hours, and each of them used about 20 watts of power. Now, keep in mind that my PDU only shows average power over time, so I think they're using anywhere from 15 to 25 watts. Is that as good as a Raspberry Pi? Well, no, but I do get an x86 processor with 8 cores, lots of high-speed storage, 2.5 gigabit networking, AES instructions, and even a GPU for QuickSync if I wanted to do any kind of transcoding. And also, this has enough compute to run anything I can throw at it, because remember, it's a Core i7. So what do I think of these low-power, small, yet powerful devices? Well, I think they're pretty awesome, if you couldn't tell by the fact that I ended up buying three. Now, is this as cheap as picking up some older, small form factor desktops? It's not, and that might be a fine option for you if you want to save some money. But I wanted to have three devices that I could keep around for years to come. Not to mention, I still have my first Intel NUC from almost nine years ago. These little devices are great for servers, especially if you're considering clustering them. And rack mounting them is a great solution if you're thinking of picking up a few. And while you don't need to go all out like I did on my server rack, a simple shelf will do just fine. Well, I learned a lot today about low power servers, Intel NUX, clustering Kubernetes, <laughs> and I hope you learned something too. And remember, if you found anything in this video helpful, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching.